Whether you're here in person, joining us online, or watching later on YouTube, welcome to First Parish and Concord. I'm Reverend Seth Carrier Ladd, your interim senior minister, and my pronouns are he, him. Joining me and leading our service this morning is Reverend Liz Weber, our Minister for Congregational Life, Reverend Amy Friedman, our Minister of Religious Education, Paul, Reverend Paul Langston Daly, our Minister of Social Action, he's right there. Uh, Beth Norton, our Director of Music and Ministry, and Anderson Manuel, our Gospel Choir Director, who is over there. So we've got a full house today. If you're online, please feel welcome to participate fully in the chat. If you're here in person and have questions about accessibility or the building, please see our ushers or any worship leader. Our COVID precautions are that we mask at all times in this space, the sanctuary, unless you're up here speaking, and that masks are optional elsewhere in the building. We also encourage social distancing as you wish, and we use air filters and ventilation to improve air quality. I invite everyone present now to stand, turn, and wave to those folks who are joining us online. Hi, everybody. However you are joining us this morning, thank you for coming. We are glad that you are here. If you noticed that it was unusual that I listed more than half our staff as helping lead the service, you picked up on something important. Our service today is going to be very different from usual. Last year, First Parish adopted the eighth principle, which states, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. Now, adopting the eighth principle is a terrific step. And now that it's adopted here, the next question is, how do we live into it? We'll reflect on some possible answers to that question in the stories shared by staff members this morning. It's important to observe as we begin this sharing that reflective of the makeup of our congregation, the majority of stories shared today will be by white people, reflecting the experience of white people attempting to serve as allies in this work. One final note about the service. In addition to singing it, the lyrics to Ella's song are woven throughout as our so the service as our sung response. The words in the song are the words of Ella Baker, whose legacy of organizing against exploitation, racism, and injustice stretches over 50 years. The first verse of Ella's song is from a statement Ella made about the murder of three civil rights movement workers, two of whom were white, one of whom was black. As the author and composer of Ella's song, Bernice Johnson Reagan wrote, we all knew that the racism of this county was such that we were now looking for the black man's body because his fellow civil rights workers were white. And so Ella Baker's response was, until the killing of black men, 
black mother's sons, is, um, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Good morning. As we begin our morning, I want to invite you to stay here all week long. I love that that joke never gets old to us. Appreciate you. This week is our second round of photo directory photos. So I had not yet signed up. I signed up hmm, Wednesday, Thursday, recently. If you, like me, had not yet signed up, it's a good idea to do so because for us as newer, I'm not newer anymore, but staff who are newer, congregants who are newer, in a large congregation trying to get to know each other, a photo directory is a really good tool to have. I would love to see your faces in it and I bet you would love to be seen. When we look ahead to next Sunday, our guests at your table boxes are due and also Stick around during coffee hour for a workshop on re-envisioning what our UU principles could look like. Coming back to today, I want to invite you to stick around again for coffee hour, which is a loosely structured way to have conversation, visit some tables and get to know what's going on at church. That's downstairs or online. It will be in breakout rooms. If you would prefer a smaller, more intimate group of folks for a little bit more structured conversation, the worship sharing circle is for you. That's over in the Brooks Room or online. It will be in a separate link that you'll see at the end of the service. Let's continue to settle into worship with our centering music. Thank you, David, for continuing as our guest musician, pianist, organist today. Oh, and y'all, David composed this piece. So really, let's settle in, let's enjoy. Thank you, David. Once more, the earth has turned toward the light of the sun. As we are bathed in the light of a new day, so may we greet the dawning of fresh possibility. Once more, we awaken from our slumber as we rise to meet the pleasures and challenges of living. So may our hearts and minds open with promise. Once more we gather for worship 
As we join our voices in word and song, may this assembly bring forth wholeness. Come, let us worship together.
Gentiles is the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, connecting us across time and space to our fellow Unitarian Universalists. Today, we kindle its flame in honor of Ella Baker and all freedom fighters through time with her words, that which touches me most is that I had the chance to work with people, passing on to others that which was passed on to me. May we all pass on to others that which we learn and which has been passed on to us in the spirit of freedom and justice and liberation. Let's join together in our chalice lighting response words in your order of service and on your screen. O flame of our faith, open our hearts and fill our bodies and souls with persistent strength. Enliven our spirits and engage us deeply in this life of ours, this sacred essential moment now. We continue held by the cup of our chalice in a time of being held in community. I'll share on your behalf the joys and sorrows that you ask to share. And then I will invite you to call out the names of whoever else you are holding in your heart and mind. This week I share that Ben T, who was scheduled to have his surgery last week, that surgery needed to be rescheduled. But he, Anna, and Jim appreciate our prayers as he continues the slow recovery from his accident. And so Ben and family, we send you our prayers, blessings, and good wishes. We also honor today that there was violence in Monterey Park, California last night, and that we don't know much about it. But we hold prayers for the families who have been touched and hope for a world that will be full of peace justice, equity, and love. And finally, today is or would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, which we can look to for hope, remembering a time when that law was the law of the land, even as we work towards its restoration. Who else would you like to honor today? I invite you to call their names now. Amen. Amen, and blessed be. Good morning. Today, I am going to share a story with you, but it's a story from my life. Did you know that I grew up in West Newton? When my parents were married, they were living in an apartment in Cambridge. It was my mom's second marriage, and my brother, Michael, was 10. And they decided, as many city folks do, to move to West Newton for the schools. And I was born in 1970. I went to Franklin Elementary School. And one of the things that I loved about it was that I got to walk to school with my friends who lived right next door. I recently participated in an anti-racism training called Jubilee. I recommend it to you highly, and you'll hear more about that. But in this online workshop, we were asked, what was your first encounter with someone who is a different racial identity. And that is when I remembered. I remembered the Metco kids in my class who were black students from Boston. I remembered how my mom used to come into my kindergarten class to help Richie learn how to read. I remembered how one Halloween, Letitia actually came over to my house for supper so that we could go back to school later for the Halloween party. I was dressed up like a clown and Letitia dressed up like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. I remembered 
that even though we were friendly, we were not friends. So today, my daughter goes to Cambridge Public Schools. That's right, I'm back in Cambridge and I'm living in my neighborhood which is racially diverse and I am proud to live in a community that prioritizes diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I have served this congregation since 2015. Can you believe it? I drive in here from Cambridge. And anti-racism work has been a part of my ministerial formation and education all along since the 1990s. However, I only realized in the past few years that the METCO program that I grew up with still exists. Not only that, I only just realized that the MECO program is a part of the Concord public school system and the lives of the children and families who I serve here at First Parish in Concord. And as a minister of religious education, I have power and influence in the local community. I am called to show up and speak out for students and families of color in Concord. And do you know what happened when I opened my heart to this truth? I started to have a different kind of connection to this congregation that I serve. I started to have conversations with people beyond this community that I serve. And I am grateful for the leadership of RJAG, that's our first parish racial justice action group, and CORE, Communities Organized Against Racism, who are finding more ways to connect, advocate, and educate. One of the things that I love about being a Unitarian Universalist is that we value lifelong learning. But it's not just the lifelong learning that I'm empowering our young people to have. It's my own lifelong learning in relationship to all of you. So I hope that you will share with me what's going on here in this community, what's going on in your schools, so we can continue to expand our circle of caring. This morning, our religious exploration has already begun because we have a group of fifth graders who are meeting in the chapel for comprehensive sexuality education. Down in the Mill Dam Nursery School, our preschoolers have already begun meeting, but if there are any preschoolers, the parents are welcome to bring them down there now. If you are in the first through fourth grade, or if you're in the sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, we are now going to move towards our classes upstairs. Thank you. Let us all join in singing. I was raised in a middle-class suburb of Dayton, Ohio in the 80s and 90s. Most of my friends and neighbors, like most people in our town, were white. In school, we were taught about slavery and the Civil War, and then about the Civil Rights Movement, especially Martin, Doc, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. My understanding of things was that 
we had had a systemic problem with racism, but that we had fought literal and political battles over the issue, and things, if not perfect, had gotten a lot better. I knew that racism was still around, but I would have said that it was a problem of individual white people who had prejudice and hate in their hearts, rather than part of our laws, society, or culture. It seemed like we were in a place where, as long as you had love in your heart, race didn't really matter anymore. The work of the 60s had paved the way for an era of colorblindness. I don't see race, some would say. We could ignore people's skin tone and finally focus on just being friends, no matter what, no matter who we were. Then my minister and invited his friend to visit our youth group. Dr. Vanelia Randall, now an elder in the community, still around. Dr. Randall is a longtime activist, a former nursing and community health professor with a focus on mother-child, maternal child health. Then she became a lawyer and a law school professor, and she's an experienced webmaster. Of course, at the time, I didn't know all of that. All I knew was that I trusted her because my minister trusted her. I was curious about what she would have to say. We sat in a circle in the parish hall, about a dozen youth and a few adults. When the ideal of being colorblind came up, Dr. Randall's response changed my world. She said, when you say you don't see race, you don't see me. She leaned forward in her chair earnestly and looked slowly around the circle, making eye contact with each of us and holding our gaze. I took in her gaze, her deep, her brown skin, her braids, her clothes. And in that moment of stillness, it felt like I saw her more deeply than I had before. My blackness is an important part of who I am. If you don't see race, you don't see me. Oh, I had never thought of it that way. I didn't think of my whiteness as an important part of who I was. I didn't really think about it that much at all. I respected my non-white friends' cultural traditions as much as I knew about them, but I also held on to this ideal of colorblindness as a great equalizer or a great neutralizer. Maybe that wasn't quite right. Maybe the work of the 60s didn't pave the way for a colorblind society after all. Maybe instead we were now in an era where each of us could actually be our whole selves, including exploring our race and ethnicity, where each of us can better know the people around us by acknowledging and honoring their whole selves. Now that I have learned more about how systemic racism and white supremacy culture continue in America, I can expand upon what I remember of Dr. Randall's words. We don't want to make stereotypical assumptions about people based on what we see. Yet we can use our knowledge to inform how we perceive someone. For example, we can guess that Dr. Randall faced multiple double standards on her way to becoming a law professor because she is black and because she is a woman and because of how those intersect. 
we can take that guess and then be curious about what that was like for her as an individual. When you say you don't see race, you don't see me. That moment sparked a change in me. I understood for the first time that our racial identity matters and that I had a lot more learning to do in order to become a better anti-racist. I wasn't bad because I hadn't known it yet. I was just learning. It opened a space in me for that learning to happen. And I'm grateful to Dr. Vinalia Randall for visiting our church that night. I learned so much from her in that simple sentence. And I keep learning still. May we all find ways to claim our full identities, to honor those we meet for who they are, and to keep learning and growing together. Amen. We who believe in morning. At this time in our service, we invite you to give generously to the work of this congregation. For all that we do to care for those within this congregation and beyond these walls, we thank you for your generous gifts this morning. We share our plate this morning with the International Institute of New England. They provide services to refugee, asylum, and immigration clients of New England. They create opportunities for refugees and immigrants to succeed throughout resettlement, education, career advancement, and pathways to citizenship. Our plate is shared 50-50 with the congregation and with, the, uh, with IINE this morning. Thank you for your gifts.
So I want to share a learning experience with you all that I had uh, that for many years has been a source of shame for me. It was a very public mistake at a time when I was living in Arizona and we were organizing against Sheriff Joe Arpaio and the far right in Arizona. I have grown a lot since then and I still make mistakes, but I think this is a useful uh, experience to share with you all. So in Arizona in 2010, the show us your papers law had been passed and people were being stopped randomly in sort of a preemptive process. An organization called Somos America, a huge coalition of unions, religious denominations, youth groups, Latino organizations, and indigenous nations had been coming together monthly uh, or bi-monthly for, uh, for, for at least a year. We had renewed energy now that this law had been passed and we were hoping to galvanize and organize more deeply. We were debating the name Somos America and specifically America. Somos America means we are America. And there was tension in the room around the use of the word America and what it meant. And as people spoke their experience of living in America, I found myself getting defensive, feeling even a little bit attacked as group after group talked about how including the name America for them was harmful in many ways. As I thought about it, I considered my own position, particularly as a transgendered man, knowing that there were few places in the world where I would be fully accepted for who I am. My focus was narrow, extremely narrow. My thinking was only of my own experience, even as I listened to people who were harmed in the founding of this nation. Eventually, I raised my hand and I launched into a defense of America, including acknowledging the fact that this is a very flawed experiment, but it's still a good experiment in how we should govern each other and one ourselves. But mostly defending the American experiment as the best of a basket in a basket of flawed options. When my rant ended, the room was silent. A middle-aged white woman passed me a note. I looked at it. It said, thank you for saying something. When I left the room, few people even acknowledged me. A few days later, a younger woman with whom I had been working on several projects asked to meet me and she called me in. She told me that what I had done was extremely harmful to many in the room. I didn't understand, but I didn't get defensive, and I didn't argue, and I didn't justify. In fact, I felt shocked. I was stunned that I had harmed people in that room. I was stunned by the damage that I had caused. I hadn't realized the impact. I had wanted to understand more fully, but knew that I couldn't ask those who had been most impacted. That had been made clear to me. And it took a while. In fact, it took several years. But today, I understand just how egregious that rant was. I hadn't been aware of how, many, how my defensive comments might impact so many in the room and those who might be hurt. I was thinking only of myself, my own experience, my very limited experience. And I was denying everything I had heard for the last 40 minutes. I was in my own head, and my reaction was completely tone deaf to the moment and to the people in the room. And I had damaged the relationships that I had spent time developing with youth and indigenous leaders. Prior to that event, I had been considered for leadership in this organization, but my comments made it impossible for many to trust me. It took me a while to go back to that group. The shame was so deep to own my mistake. And while I never had the opportunity to make a public apology to that group, I worked hard 
to change my behavior, to attend to my defensiveness and to be curious about it, to be more mindful of who is in the room when I speak, and to know that if my even if my intentions are truly benevolent or benign, then my task will be more to be more concerned about the impact on others than with my own defense. If I care, then I'm less concerned with what I said and more concerned with how it landed. This work is hard. And more than once, I've wanted to run away because I have experienced shame when I make a mistake, especially one so public. But my faith, my theology reminds me, my belief in freedom means nothing if I am unwilling to do the work. Many of you know I was raised Unitarian Universalist in Western Massachusetts at the Unitarian Society of Northampton in Florence. And so I've been doing anti-racism work for a long time as a Unitarian Universalist. And then I dove even deeper 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, my how the time passes, when I began seminary and my ministerial training. And I've done a lot of learning and I've learned and done a lot of work. And I also know that I still have a lot to learn. And this was highlighted for me in something that happened about four years ago. I continue to be a co-moderator of a group on Facebook for UU ministers across the country who do worship planning. So there's quite a number, large number of folks who are in the group. Um, and it's generally a pretty easygoing group, right? Worship is, a, is, a, is not usually a controversial topic. But it just so happened about four years ago that someone in the, in the group made a post that embodied in some ways white supremacy culture. And my co-moderator and I were, were like, uh-oh, we don't actually have a policy. We don't have a way to address this and handle it. So uh, we worked at it. We actually set aside a lot of other work and spent a whole bunch of time over the next couple of days working really hard to craft a policy to address how we try and hold the person accountable, how we try and help the, someone who makes a, makes a statement in the group, how we try and help them and help the group. Right? We worked really hard on it. Um, and then, knowing, knowing from doing the work that we shouldn't just be our eyes, we asked other folks to get their feedback to make sure we had done a good job. I checked in with my spouse, who happens to be a leader uh, on the Allies for Racial Equity group, which is the UU Ally group, national group. Um, and my colleague checked in, and we got feedback, and we, we thought, okay, we're in good shape. And so we proudly posted our policy the next day. And the first couple of responses came in, and they were positive, and I was like, ah, oh, feeling good. And then the next response came in. It was from a person of color. And it said, where am I in this document? And I, was, I read it and I was like, Wh what? I, I, I didn't understand the question. And so I went back and started rereading what we wrote. And I was thinking in my head, you're everywhere in this document. This is all about trying to respond, right? except that as I kept reading, I realized that everything we had written was addressing what happened when a white person posted something problematic. The policy didn't actually say anything about the experiences of people of color or the impact on people with marginalized identities who were in the group. We wrote an anti-oppression policy that focused on the white dominant culture, behavior, and experience in people and failed to even mention or address the experience of people with marginalized identities. We had embodied the very thing we were trying to combat. 
once the light bulb went off in my head, I had some feelings, and they were all defensiveness. I kept trying to make excuses. Well, of course the policy was oriented towards white people and dominant identities because that's who we need the policy for. No, that is actually an excuse I was able to check myself with. Well, okay, but we checked it with other people and they didn't catch it either. Also an excuse. Okay, fine, but that's how a lot of policies are, yeah, yuck, still an excuse. All of those responses I was having internally were white fragility. Me feeling bad that I had made a mistake and trying to defend myself. It wasn't the easiest 10 minutes of my life, certainly, uh, but after a few more minutes of inter internally arguing with myself, I was finally able to admit to myself, as much as I didn't like it, that there is no excuse. I just did that thing that was not okay. And so I finally responded online to the second comment, to that, to that next co that comment saying, you're 100% right. I apologize, we'll leave this draft up for now, but please know that we'll get a better version written and posted as soon as we can. Well, I'm really grateful that that exchange happened on the internet because, if I, because I had time and space to think, right? But I know that if I had received that feedback in person, I probably would have said all of those things that I was thinking in my head out loud to the person who was trying to call me in. And I'm grateful that I had the space so that didn't have to happen. In our debriefing, my co-moderator and I realized that we had made a couple of other mistakes. One was that we had only asked white people to review our work. Second was that we were both white, heterosexual, and cisgendered, and that we needed to invite a person with a marginalized identity to be a third co-moderator. The biggest takeaway for me, though, was of just how pervasive white supremacy culture is. Even with years of learning and training, even with carefully crafting a policy to help fight white supremacy culture, and even after seeking outside review, we still embodied the very thing we were trying to combat. Hello everyone. Many of you guys see me every Sunday, but you really don't know who I am. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about who I am. Um, for those of you who do not know, I came here from Haiti when I was 11 years old. And at that time, I was in elementary school. When you come from Haiti and your perception of the United States is, you see, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what you think of this country. I thought I was coming into a country where the city is paved with gold, <laughs> where people were very welcoming, and, and then I started middle school. And not only did I not know how to speak um, the language, but I was also confused. The first mistake that I made was that I thought that the people who had the same skin color as I did spoke French. <laughs> so I walked up to this African-American kid and I started speaking French. And looked at me, smacked me, and walked away. So that was my first experience. I'm like, uh-oh, this person does not speak French, okay? 
So for several years, I struggled. But at another time, I'll tell you guys a story of how my parents came to this country. My parents have always told me, excuses, excuses, excuses will not get you anywhere. Focus, focus on why you are here. My parents left Haiti so they can provide me with an opportunity to have a better education. So that I did. I grew up a strong, my father is a Baptist minister, a strong Baptist young man growing up in the city of Boston. And I got involved in the Baptist church and really focused on getting a great education. And then I was very fortunate to attend Boston College. But I had so much anger inside. I felt like I, everywhere I went, I was an outsider, not only because of my language barriers, but also I couldn't be accepted by anyone except in the Baptist community. Fast forward when I got to Boston College, I realized that I knew nothing of this culture, I knew nothing of the people who really made this opportunity available for me. So, you know, at Boston College you had to take theology and philosophy classes, so I decided to take a, a year class on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. I took a, my theology classes on the life of Jesus Christ, and then I took my philosophy classes on the history of religion, and then I completely changed. I am now an educator. I teach the little ones. I call them my people. I am an elementary educator. And hanging on the wall in my classroom is a copy of Michael Jackson, Men in the Mirror. I will tell you why later on. And a copy of the I Have a Dream speech that Dr. Martin Luther King delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. As you can recall, many people gathered on Washington, D.C. on August 28, 1963, a one-day prote protest against racial discrimination to encourage Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act. If you have never read or listened to Dr. King's speech, or if it has been a while since you have read it, I strongly encourage you to do so. Each time, I read Dr. King's speech, I am reminded that the struggle for equality continues. I am consistently struck by his way with words and his uncanny sense of metaphors to accurately portray the feelings of people of color then and now. I am also aware that in contemporary society, many have made the mistake of romanticizing and diluting Dr. King's ideas. Even the words and intentions of the I Have a Dream speech, which Dr. King asserted had become a nightmare in a 1967 interview with then NBC News correspondent Sender Vanneker. His fiery sermon of nearly 50 years ago is now reinterpreted and repurposed by people from across ide ideological spectrum often recasting his words to better serve their own agendas. To some, listening to Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech through a narrow lens suggests a toned down message of sitting with little black boys and black girls, joining hands with little bo white boys and girls as sisters and brothers as the only goal. This simplification makes it possible to claim that racism is dead that sins of the past remains in the past, that a white man sitting next to a black man means any remaining issues are just imagined, a fault of your own, not systematic and not worthy as addressing as a nation. However, this is inaccurate and harmful to Dr. King's legacy and a misappropriation of his words. The joining of hands was a goal, but not the root goal. In fact, the joining of hands was by a product of fostering and cultivating what we called 
the beloved community. The idea that if we are to achieve a truly equitable, equitable and just community, then a strong foundation of economic and social justice must be established first. Without an understanding of the beloved community and the responsibilities required, any efforts will result in good intentions, but with the same potentially disastrous results. To Dr. King, the beloved community was a thought that our destinies, our mere existence, and even our liberation is intertwined. This is why Dr. King argued that no one is free unless we are all free. I really love his speech that he delivered in 1957, The Birth of a Nation, to friends and supporters at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And at that time, he was delivering it after coming from Ghana. He stated, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation. The aftermath of violence are emptiness and bitterness. Reconciliation, the crux of the beloved community, requires an expectation to be changed when you enter into a relationship with another. To put it in another way, reconciliation is not merely a call to develop friends across identity lines. It is through dedication, commitment, daily reminding yourself that you cannot rest until your last breath. To reduce reconciliation to friendship is to, divert, is to divest it to its potency, potency. A life of reconciliation is to acknowledge that the identities and perspective of the person we are engaging with causes a shift in our own identity, experience, and perspective. In my opinion, I can stand here and share with you my life story and how I dealt with racism and still deal with racism on a consistent basis. That's for another time. But I know that as an educator, father, and human being, I am constantly working on creating a beloved community of the soul within myself. I realized even then in high school that in order for me to grow as a human being, the change it had to happen within. I had to do the work by reading, thinking, and working on being an active participant so that I can be ready for the work every day and look for opportunities to create a beloved community and learn through reconciliation how to let it radiate outward like the rays of the sun. I also learned that through adversity, it is these adversities that have helped me to transform into the man that I am today. When George Floyd murder went viral on social media, something sparked in millions of us. Suddenly, Dr. King's injunction became all the more urgent. But these experiences have been happening for years. They just were never been caught on social media before. These experiences is what helps us to understand that these are experiences that people like me goes through every single day. But the end is, it is all about reconciliation. The end to me is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. This is why I am here. It is the type of spirit and this type of love that can transform complete strangers into friends. Now, let's get back to Michael Jackson. If you've ever listened to the song, Men in the Mirror, Okay, it goes a little something like this. 
And believe it or not, in my classroom every day we sing this song. Not the whole song. It goes a little something like this. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make a world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. The change can happen, but it takes work. It takes education. It takes not resting until we are all free.
we close our service today with a moment of prayer. And so friends, I invite you to join me and Seth in prayer and meditation. This is from Reverend Margley Belazer. Spirit of light and love, spirit of resistance, spirit of generosity, that which serves as our conscience in this work that we do to dismantle white supremacy, to empower the marginalized, to insist that black lives matter, matter. We have been angered, we have been saddened, we have been pushed to the brink once more. We are also inspired and seem resolved to do better this time. To not simply get to the other side of this moment, but to get there morally healthier, to create a safer space for black bodies. Spirit, help us to understand that we each have a role in justice work, for our liberations are tied to one another's. Give us the clarity of mind to know what our individual part is in the struggle, that there are many ways to protest injustice. Help us to find our way and commit to it. Spirits, we ask for guidance. Send us strength and endurance. Help us to give our all to this and hold nothing back, for precious lives depend on it. We will be imperfect. Rest assured that we will mess up over and over again. And we must do it anyway. May we summon the courage to tear down this system of injustice and get busy creating a world community with justice for all. May it be so, and amen. We will now enter into a brief period of silent reflection. We light three candles now. The first candle is for all people of color and indigenous folks who are harmed regularly and on an ongoing basis from living in a country whose very fabric is woven from white supremacy culture. We hold you in love and care. Our second candle is a blessing for all those committed to the work of fighting racism and eradicating white supremacy culture. May your hearts be held in love. May you be connected with your inner strength. May you find resilience from within and from what those around you as you work to heal and transform our communities, our country, and our world. Our third and final candle represents our hopes for the work ahead. We are all at different places on our journey. For some here today, the idea that colorblindness is less than ideal and that we need to be able to see the differences to be able to understand and honor them, for some here today, that might be new. For some, the idea of intent versus impact, that even if we have good intent, we are still responsible for the sometimes negative impact of our actions. For some, that might be new. For some, the idea of white fragility, the defensiveness that white people often experience when discovering their role in white supremacy culture, might be new. And for some, perhaps the concepts are not new, but the reminder remains important that even with training and experience, white supremacy culture lives within us and can show up at any time. Our hope for you, for all of us today, is that wherever you are in your journey, 
you remain open to learning, that you remain committed even and especially when you make mistakes, and that you show up and do the work even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable. Our faith and our values call us to nothing less. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe, of, who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Friends, I think we have said all the words today that need to be said at this point. So for our closing, let's just invite you to stand so we can say our benediction facing our good friends online. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help us suffering, honor all beings. Go and be blessed and be a blessing. We'll end our time together. Please stay standing if you can for this wonderful song by Melanie Moore. We don't need the words, we'll give them to you. You've got to put one foot in front of the other and leave with love. you got to put one foot.